Jerusalem. Some people are born into positions of power and prestige, and that was no doubt the case with Uzziah. Some people have the fortune of being born into a world of royalty and of plenty, and that was the case with Uzziah. Uzziah was a descendant of Rehoboam. The, the nation of the, the Judah had 20 kings in its history. It started with Rehoboam and it ended with Zedekiah. And Uzziah was number 10. So in this story, we find ourselves halfway through the history of the kings of Judah. And he's just 16 years old when he becomes king. His father was Amaziah. And we learn from chapter 25 and verse 2 that Amaziah followed the Lord but not wholly with all of his heart. And Amaziah being the ninth king of, of Judah. But we see here that Uzziah got off to a great start. Read verses 4 and 5 with me. And he, that is Uzziah, did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah did. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord... God made him to prosper. You know, that's something that I think we need to always take a, a account of and realize is that when we prosper, when, when Uzziah prospered, what was it that made him prosper? It was the Lord. Just like uh, we, we read in Daniel 4 and 17, God rules in the affairs of men. And we see all throughout biblical history him raising up kings and, and, and tearing them down. And so Uzziah gets off to a great start. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And, and he, he sought God in the days of Zechariah. You know, that's something that a good king would do. And Israel didn't have too many good kings. Judah had a few more. But you remember in 1 Chronicles 16 and 29, this is David, which would have been a great, 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 great grandfather of Uzziah. He said, give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Uzziah was seeking God. And he was seeking God, and to have been seeking God, you have to seek after him in the right way. And so he would have uh, engaged in proper worship, but we also will see that he engaged in proper leadership. Uzziah as a youth is, is, is a very interesting story, but he didn't stay a youth. We're going to see that he became a very powerful king. Pick up with me in verse number 6. And we're going to read through verse 15 together. And he went forth and warred against the Philistines and break down the wall of Gath and the wall of Jebna and the wall of Ashdod and built cities about Ashdod and among the Philistines. And God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabians that dwelled in Gerbal and the Mahinums. And the Ammonites gave gifts to uh, Uzziah, and his name spread abroad even into the entering in of Egypt, for he strengthened himself exceedingly. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate and at the valley gate and at the turning of the wall and fortified them. Also he built towers in the desert, and he digged many wells, for he had much cattle, both in the low country and in the plains, Husbandmen also, and vine dressers in the mountains, and in Carmel, for he loved husbandry. Moreover, Uzziah had an host of fighting men that went out to war by bands, according to the number of their account, by the hand of Jael, and the scribe, and uh, Meshelah, and the ruler, under the hand of Hananiah, one of the king's captains. The whole number of the chief of the fathers of the mighty men of valor were two thousand and six hundred. And under their hand was an army, 300,000 and 7,500, that made war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy. And Uzziah prepared for them throughout all the host, shields and spears and helmets and uh, harbor gins and bows and slings to cast stones. And he made in Jerusalem engines 
invented by cunning men to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones withal. And his name was spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped until he was strong. We see here that as a powerful king, Uzziah triumphed politically over his enemies. If you notice that it says that he warred against the Philistines and he broke down the wall. He broke down the wall of Gath and of uh, Jebna and of, of Ashdod and he built cities around about Ashdod and among the Philistines. So not only did he, did he conquer the enemies and his political power spread, but then he even himself built cities and controlled them behind enemy lines, so to speak. So he was politically very, very powerful. And his name, it says, spread abroad even to the entering in of Egypt. But he wasn't just politically strong. He was militarily strong. Did you catch how organized and how prepared and how inventive King Uzziah was? It says that when he broke down the wall and he built cities... But he built towers in Jerusalem and at the corner gate and the valley gate and at the turning of the wall and he fortified them. So this is defensive strategy. Oh yes, he had bands of men to make war and to go out and make war, but he didn't just focus on the offensive side. He had a defensive strategy as well to take care of those at home. And he had the, the, the fighting men that went out to war, and he had a great number of very valiant men that would make war and fight with him. But he didn't just have these men go out without anything. He prepared, he made preparations for them. It, it says that he, he gave them uh, shields and spears and helmets and uh, habergeons and bows and slings to cast stones and these men were very good at war with these items. And he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men. These would have been machinery. These would have been able to launch large rocks, large spear-like objects. This would have been mid-700 B.C. weapons of mass destruction, if you will. They would have been able to uh, cause great amounts of damage. But he had God on his side. The text says that God greatly increased him. It, it reminds me of what Joshua uh, had penned in Joshua 23.10 that one shall put a thousand to flight because the Lord thy God fights for thee. You know, it was, it was good and it was right for the King Uzziah to build up the military and to do his part. But the bottom line is, is that God was involved because Uzziah was following the Lord and seeking after him and doing that which is right. So... He was powerful politically and militarily and then personally. His fame spread throughout the entire world. That's what happens when God exalts a person, isn't it? I mean, it says here in verse 15, And his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously, marvelously helped. Who helped him? It was God that helped him. And, 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 so, and he was very, very strong. How do we handle it when God exalts us? How do we handle exaltation? Do we give credit where credit's due? Or do we see what happens to Uzziah in a moment? Pick up with me in verse 16. And let's read through verse 18. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him fourscore priests of the Lord that were valiant men. And they withstood Uzziah the king, and said unto him, It appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron, 
that are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed. Neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. This is the one blot that appears on the name of Uzziah. This is the one blot, and, it all, and it's all because Uzziah believed the press clippings, and he became full of himself. I recall what Solomon said about pride in Proverbs 16 and 18. That pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. We're going to see a great man, a great man that was born into power and royalty. And his father goes off to war and he brings back false gods. And his father burns incense on the altar of false gods. And, and, and the Lord takes the kingdom from him. And Uzziah becomes king. And he is made great. And he is going to force himself into the holy place to burn off, to offer incense upon the altar of God Almighty. I, I'm reminded what James, we're studying James on Wednesday. I'm, I'm reminded what James wrote on, in James 4 and 6. Where it says that God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Here we see Uzziah use his position and his power and his prestige to bypass or ignore God's law. It was not the king's duty. It was not the king's right to enter into the holy place and offer incense on the altar of burnt incense. God had established an order and a rule for this to take place. It was not the king's position. It was the priest. In Exodus chapter 30, verses 7 through 9, the Bible says Aaron shall burn fragrant incense on it. He shall burn it every morning when he trims the lamps. When Aaron trims the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense. There shall be a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall not offer any strange incense on this altar or burnt offering or mill offering, and you shall not pour out a drink offering on it. There were rules. There, there were rules then, and there are rules today. We, we see in 1 Chronicles 6 and 29, the Bible says there Aaron and his sons offered on the altar of burn, in, of burn offering and on the altar of incense. Who did it? Aaron and his sons. They were the ones that were sanctified and set apart and consecrated to the office of priests to do that sort of thing. Instead of lifting up the name of God who, who had exalted him to such a high and prestigious uh, position in the, in the world, he lifted up his own name and he lifted up his own heart and pride. He invaded an office that God had not given him. Uzziah had plenty to do with what God had given him, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. His fathers had gone and offered uh, incense on the altar of false gods. And Uzziah comes in and he's going to offer incense on the altar of God. You see how easy it is for mankind for us to go from one extreme to the other? Somehow we're not happy with the truth. It's right down the middle. And it cost us greatly. The priest withstood him, and they pled with him, Do not do this. It does not appertain to you. They withstood him, and they told him, This is not going to be for your honor. This is going to be a great dishonor. These men were mighty men. They were valiant men. Just because they were priests doesn't mean that they were weak. They were valiant, mighty, strong men, men of God, and they were, uh, they were dedicated to honoring God. And so here they are. They withstand the king. In verse 19 through 23, let's finish out the chapter. Then Uzziah was wroth, and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth, the priest 
when he was wroth with the priest, leprosy even arose in his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead, and they thrust him out from thence. Yea, himself hasted also to go out, because the Lord had smitten him. And Uzziah the king was a leper unto the day of his death, and dwelled in a several house, being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. Now the rest of the acts of Uzziah, first and last, did Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, write. So Uzziah slept with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the field of the burial which belonged to the kings. For they said, He is a leper. And Jotham his son reigned in his stead. Here we see a picture of Uzziah, God's anointed king, going into an unauthorized place, and God's priest would stand him, and instead of listening to good sound advice, what did he do? He got angry. What do you mean this don't appertain to me? Don't you know who I am? Don't you know that I'm the king? Don't you, haven't you heard of my fame? Don't you, haven't you seen my military might, my political prowess? How much does that matter to God? How much does that matter to God? God's spokesmen were pleading with him, and what did he do? He doubled down on his sin, but God showed him at that moment that he meant business. Josephus is a secondary uh, writing, interesting to note. Josephus records that Uzziah threatened the priests with death if they withstood him. Sounds right for a man filled with pride, doesn't it? And at that moment, Josephus records that the earth shook, the roof of the temple opened, and through a cleft, a beam of sunlight landed on Uzziah's forehead, and that leprosy appeared immediately. And this immediately emboldened the priest. They told him, you get out of here. But you know what? It hit him immediately when that happened. Oh, no, I've messed up. But you know, sin has consequences. And just because we may repent of those sins does not mean we don't have to deal and bear with the, the physical, earthly consequences of those sins. It reminds me of what we talked about Wednesday night about anger in Ecclesiastes 7, 9. Truly, anger rests in the bosom of fools. What a foolish thing for Uzziah to do. What a foolish thing for Uzziah to take upon himself Something that God had not given him. You know, God has given us so much. God has given mankind roles, men roles to execute in daily life and in the church. And how sad it is when men do not fulfill those roles. But what about women? God has given women roles to fill in society and in the church. And how sad it is when we see them try to transgress and to take on roles that God has not given them. And that's a two-way street. That's men and women. Oh, for a society that looks at what God has given us and the roles that he has placed us in. And, and, and we would happily accept those things and, and, and work on fulfilling those things. What did it cost Uzziah? It says in verse 21 that he became a leper under the day of his death. And he dwelled in a several house, being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. What a steep price to pay for anger, for selfishness, for the desire to do something my own way and to forget doing it God's way. He was cut off from relationships. He was cut off from the throne. He had to give up his reign. His son had to take over and to judge Israel. If, if we just made a list of everything his sin cost him, but he was buried with an epitaph that said, He 
is a leper. There was nothing to remember about his, 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 his reign and how he had conquered uh, all the enemies of God and how he had built cities and how he was greatly helped by the Lord and all of his fame and all of his fortune and all of his military prowess. That's not what he's remembered for. He's remembered because he's a leper. There's a few practical lessons that I think that we can learn from, from this sad story of the fall of a great king. And that is, if you were to die today, what would your epitaph read? You know, we are writing a legacy by the way in which we live our lives right here and right now. And when we die, there's no more time to make decisions on how we want to live our lives. We're either going to be saved here and now or we're not going to be saved because after we die... It's over. That's how we're going to stand before our God. And there's no more time to write a eulogy. But moreover, how is our family going to recognize us? How are our friends and our community going to recognize us? More importantly, will Jesus recognize us? For many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, but I will profess unto them, depart from me. I never knew you. Depart from me. I do not recognize you. The second practical lesson I want us to take note of is that God is who he is, and we are who we are. Open up to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, this is in the year that King Uzziah died, the great prophet Isaiah sees a vision, and notice in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. And with twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Listen to Isaiah's response. Then said I, woe is me. What is the response of this great man of God when he comes into contact with the holiness, the awesomeness, the power of God Almighty? Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips and dwell among a people of unclean lips. Mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, in Revelation chapter 4, let's notice John's vision. In Revelation chapter 4, starting in verse 8, And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not, night, not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and they worship him that lived forever and ever and they cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and they were created." This is, this is us coming in contact with the awesomeness and the power and the majesty of God Almighty. God is not our peer. We are his subjects. We are his servants. And when God gives commands, we must not lift, be lifted up with pride with the things that he's blessed us with and the position and the power and the royalty and the might that we think we possess. We must humbly submit every single time 
A man has come into contact with the awesomeness of God. He has had the same exact effect. You think of a man like Moses in Exodus 3. Moses, take your shoes off for the ground upon which thou standest is holy ground. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. God is holy. You think of a man like Job, when God appeared to him in the whirlwind. And Job said, I have heard thee with the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee, and I abhor myself, and I repent in dust and ashes. You come to the, uh, Luke chapter 5, and you see uh, Peter, and they've been fishing. And, and Jesus tells them to let down their net for a draught. And he says, Lord, we ain't caught anything all night, but whatever, I'm going to do it. And when they caught all those fish, Peter came to the shore. He dropped down on his knees and he said, depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. God is not our equal. We are his subjects. We are his servants. But the third practical lesson I want us to consider is that there are dangers in living in a non-miraculous age. You think about all the times that God dealt with people throughout biblical history and the things that happened to them. You've got the earth opening up and swallowing the, the, the men that uh, charge Moses and uh, Aaron and, 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 and what that did. To the people that saw that, you see Gehazi is another man struck with leprosy. As he runs after the, the train uh, of this great man who has brought all this wealth, Naaman. And he says, you know what? We've changed our mind. We'll take, we'll take the gifts. We'll take the money. We'll take the clothing. God struck him with leprosy. Just think of of what that did, how that showed the people. Herod, a man that we mentioned last week, who gave a great oration, and he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms with, and, and died. And you think about Ananias and Sapphira, who lied not unto men, but they lied unto God, and both of them fell down dead. But we don't live in a miraculous age, and there can be danger involved in that every time God expressed his power in such a way what does it say and great fear came upon all them that believed there was a there was a point to God doing what he did but it's dangerous for us today Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 11 because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily the hearts of the sons of men are set fully to do evil May we always remember who God is and how we should be humble in his presence. James 4 and 10, humble yourself into the mighty hand of the Lord and he will lift you up. Humility is more than just a feeling. Humility is demonstrated by one's submission. And a life of submission to God begins today with your obedience to the gospel. The gospel that you must hear, Romans 10, 17. And faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And that faith cultivating in you a belief that Jesus is who he said he was, the resurrected Lord, John 8 and 24. Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Being willing then to repent of a past wicked way of life, tell you nay except you repent. You will all likewise perish, Luke 13, 3 and verse 5. And at the times of this ignorance, God once winked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. And if you're willing to do that, are you willing to confess him before men, Matthew 10, 32? He that confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. What a beautiful day that will be if you have confessed the sweet name of Jesus and then give your body to be buried with him, to be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. He will add you to his beautiful body, the bride, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you've done those things. 
But maybe as a child of God, you've allowed sin into your life. Maybe as a child of God, you've struggled with pride. Maybe as a child of God, you have failed to seek after the Lord. Why don't you repent and pray? Why don't you do it right now as together we stand and sing? Oh, Jesus, I surrender all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence day. turn to number 43. I'll be thankful for that message. Let's sing the first verse of 43 and we'll take a short break and start our classes in a few moments. <coughs> Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. to us that we need it for a better understanding of thy word and we're thankful that you have given us the blessings of life uh, we take for granted so many things we live in a land of plenty and we pray that we will share those of the countries that are needing help now at this time especially Ukraine 
those families have been separated and the young kids are orphans now. We pray that you would lead them to the homes that they can go to, the Christian people that are still there that are trying to help those people that are coming under fire with the uh, losing their freedoms. We enjoy the freedom that we have here that we can come and worship you, <coughs> not just for today, but every day we can come to you in prayer. Thanking you for the many blessings of life you give to us from day to day. The beauty that you show around us, the four seasons you give to us. We're so thankful that the good help that we do have, that we're able to come out and worship and sing praises unto thee. We do pray for those who are sick and afflicted, that they would be restored to good health, if it's thy will. Be with those who have lost loved ones, comfort them. We pray that you would watch over us as we leave this place and give us a safe trip back home. Watch over us and care for us and forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.